In today's video from Free Pilot Training, I'm going to explain in detail how to use the manual E6B flight computer, aka the WizWheel. This device allows you to make nearly any calculation you might need in flight and is especially handy once you start getting into cross country flying. When you first look at it, the E6B can seem a little bit intimidating and complicated, almost like a piece of ancient alien technology that was left behind from the Roswell incident an extraterrestrial device which was given to the Israelites during their 40-year wandering through the desert. Yeah, probably not. But actually, the old whiz wheel is a lot simpler than you might think, and it's extremely easy to use. The front side, where we'll be doing most of our time, fuel, and distance calculations, operates based on the 60 to 1 rule. This principle works because there's 60 minutes in an hour. So basically, this thing is just multiplying and dividing our distances and fuel by 60. That's all it's doing. I know you were probably hoping it was aliens, but unfortunately, that's not the case this time. It looks something that, you know, came from outer space. It's the only conclusion that you can draw. Anyway, now that you know that, the E6B is going to make a lot more sense when you go to use it. Now before I start showing you how to use this thing, I want to point out one more thing. The whiz wheel will calculate miles per hour and knots exactly the same. The 60 to 1 rule applies the same to statute miles as it does for nautical miles. And I suppose if you really wanted, you could probably also make calculations in kilometers as well. And this is really nice because you can actually take your flight computer on road trips and practice making calculations when you see road signs that tell you the distance remaining to your destination. You'll want to have the driver set the cruise control and it's kind of cool to see how close you can get. Alright, let's take a closer look at this thing. On the outer ring, we always find our distance. That's going to be either nautical miles, statute miles, or whatever. Then, when we start making fuel calculations, we'll be using the outer scale for that as well. Then on the inner scale, we have our time. And for almost every problem we solve, our time is going to be on the inner scale. The exception to this is when we convert back and forth from true airspeed to calibrated airspeed. But we'll discuss that more in a few minutes. And because we find time on the inside of the scale, these numbers in here are all multipliers of 60 because we're either multiplying or dividing by 60. And by rotating the scale, that's all we're doing is creating a 60 to 1 ratio. That's it. You still think it might have been aliens? And the answer is a potential yes. Now one other thing you need to know is that there are no single digits on these scales. Notice here on the outer scale that there isn't a 1. There's only a 10. This 10 can represent 1. It can represent 10, it can represent 100, 1000, or basically any multiplier of 10. The important thing to remember is that if you turn this into a 1 by moving a decimal over, you need to do it to the number on the other side as well. For example, if my flight computer is set in this configuration and my distance is 1 mile, I'll use the 10 because there isn't a 1. Now I move the decimal over to turn this into a 1. When I look across, I read 11 minutes. But because I move the decimal to the left on this side, I also need to move the decimal over to the left on the inner scale as well. So my answer in this case will be 1.1 minutes, not 11. There's one exception to this rule. Anytime my speed is faster than 60, the 10 on the inner scale is rotated to the right of the 10 on the outer scale. The numbers in between these two 10s will be one digit off. And if you add a zero to the outer scale, the inner scale will read correctly. For example, if I add a zero to make this 120 miles, the number I read across from that will still be 70 minutes because it's in between the two 10s. If you forget this little trick, that's okay. You can still just use a little common sense too because it's going to be pretty obvious that 700 minutes is not the correct answer. And now that you understand that, I'll show you how to make these calculations. The first calculation you might want to make is to find out how fast you're going. This one's pretty simple. In order to find that, we need to know two things. First, we need to know the distance that we traveled. And we also need to know how long it took us to get there. Let's start with an easy one. Let's say we traveled two statute miles and it took us two minutes to get there. Now you probably already know the answer without using this thing, but we'll do a harder one here in a second. Start with your distance on the outer scale. If you ever forget, these whiz wheels usually have markings on the outer scale to remind you that that's for distance. And we said our distance was two statute miles, so let's use this two zero because there's not a two on here. Then we'll find our time on the inner scale. Now the inner dial has two scales on it. 
On the outer part of the dial, you'll find minutes, and on the inner part of the dial, you'll find hours. So let's rotate the scale until two minutes lines up with two statute miles. Once we do that, we want to know our speed. And the way we express that is how far we went in one hour. One hour is 60 minutes, and so the 60 is typically marked with a nice big arrow and sometimes labeled with the word rate. So we will find our speed right across from that arrow. In this example, we can see that we're traveling 60 statute miles in 60 minutes, or 60 miles per hour. Very simple. Let's make it a little bit more difficult. Let's say we traveled 80 nautical miles and it took us 70 minutes to get there. Now how fast are we going? Well, let's see. Let's find our distance of 80 nautical miles in the outer scale, and rotate our time of 70 minutes until it lines up with the 80. Now we want to know our speed in nautical miles per hour. And one hour is 60 minutes, so we simply look across from the 60 arrow again. Let's see, here's 65, 66, 67. Looks like just over 68 knots. So our speed is 68 knots. Let's try one more. Let's say we traveled 110 nautical miles and it took us one hour and 20 minutes. First, let's find 110 nautical miles on the outer ring. As you can see, we just add a zero and this 11 becomes 110. Now we rotate the dial until an hour and 20 minutes on the inner scale lines up with that number. And as you can see, one hour and 20 minutes is also 80 minutes. Then once again, we look for our rate triangle at 60 minutes. And now we can see that we're traveling just over 82 knots. Too easy. Now I want to point out something. Anytime you come up with a speed in relation to your distance over the ground, this is your ground speed. Let's back up and discuss that just for a second. There are basically four types of airspeed that you need to know about as a pilot. First is your true airspeed. Your true airspeed is basically the speed at which your aircraft is traveling through the air around you. This is not what you see on your airspeed indicator, and the reason for this is because as the air gets thinner, there are fewer air molecules that can enter your pitot system, and that air pressure entering the pitot tube is what your airspeed indicator is measuring. So as the air gets thinner, your indicated airspeed will decrease, but your true airspeed will actually increase because thinner air means there's less drag on the aircraft. Now if you remember from my previous videos, the air gets thinner or the pressure decreases anytime you increase your altitude and anytime the temperature rises. And that's because warm air is less dense than cool air. So your true airspeed is directly related to the outside air temperature and the air pressure. Indicated airspeed, on the other hand, is what you actually see on your airspeed indicator. This is not how fast you're traveling through the air around you. It's how fast your airplane thinks it's traveling through the air around you. All the airplane cares about is air molecules going through the pitot tube. It doesn't know when you're at higher altitudes and that there aren't as many air molecules up at higher altitudes. It also doesn't know when some of the air that's hitting the front of the pitot tube is wind or when it's just air from the airplane moving straight ahead. It's measuring all of the relative wind entering the pitot tube. Next, we have our calibrated airspeed. And this one's a little bit weird. It's what your indicated airspeed should be if engineers were able to create a perfect system to measure airspeed. The problem that occurs when your airplane flies through the air is that the pitch of the aircraft changes any time you change your speed, flap configuration, and gear configuration. And because of that, the air can hit the pitot tube at different angles. So this causes errors. And every aircraft is different. So you have to look in the POH to see what the calibration errors are for the airplane that you're flying. Last but not least, we have our ground speed. This is the actual speed that we're traveling over the ground. And this depends on two things, our true airspeed and the wind. And this is the speed we need to find any time we're making timing calculations. Because unfortunately, you can't just look down at your airspeed indicator and come up with these calculations. And that's because indicated airspeed doesn't account for air density and wind. We're going to get more into that in just a minute, but let's move on with some of these calculations. Another calculation that you might need to make with the E6B is to find out how long it will take you to get somewhere. Let's say you're traveling at 120 miles per hour this time, and we're going to be traveling 180 statute miles. How long will it take us to get there? Well, we already know our rate in 60 minutes is 120 miles, so let's rotate the rate arrow over to 12. Remember, distance is on the outer scale, so let's look for 180 on the outside. There it is. Now we simply look across from that to see that it should take us 90 minutes to get there. 
Our rate arrow is above 60 knots, and the numbers we're looking for are in between the two tens, so 90 minutes is the correct answer, not 900. We could also look at our hour scale, and that would be an hour and 30 minutes. Now, what if I'm traveling the same speed and I'm only going 13 miles? Our flight computer is already set up. Now how long will it take? Well, let's look up here at the 13 on the outer ring, and that's because 13 was our distance. Then, we simply look across from that. Remember, the arrow is 60, so it looks like 65, so we simply move the decimal over to get 6.5 minutes. Remember, 65 is in between the two tens, so it's one digit off, so it's going to take us 6 minutes and 30 seconds to go 13 miles. Next, you may need to calculate how far you traveled. Let's go back to knots again. Let's say we're traveling 90 knots, and it took us 1 hour and 40 minutes to get there. How far did we go? Let's start with our rate of 60 minutes and put that on our distance of 90 nautical miles. And that gets us our 90 nautical miles per hour, or 90 knots. Now we simply look for our time on the inner ring. We said that it took us 1 hour and 40 minutes to get there. So how far did we travel? Let's look at the inner scale for 1 hour and 40 minutes, which is also 100 minutes, and it looks like we traveled 150 nautical miles. What if we're traveling 73 knots and it took us 73 minutes? Now how far did we go? Let's start with our rate. Unless your clock has 48 minutes in an hour because you're a flat earther, your rate is once again 60 minutes. So let's rotate that to 73 nautical miles on the outer ring. Let's look at our time on the inner scale of 73 minutes and we can read our distance once again on the outer ring. It looks to me like we traveled just under 89 nautical miles. The next type of calculation that the old whiz wheel can give us is how fast we're going. Once again, this is our ground speed, and that's because we're coming up with these numbers in relation to our time and distance over the ground. Let's say we traveled 16 statute miles and it took us 13 minutes to get there. How fast are we going? We know our distance is 16 statute miles, so let's find that on the outer scale. Then, we know it took us 13 minutes, so let's rotate the 13 on the inner scale to match the 16. Now we need to look for our rate. And once again, we want to know our speed in relation to 60 minutes. So let's look over here at the rate triangle. It looks like our speed is just under 74 miles per hour. Now if you're a flat earther, I'll throw you a bone and you can find your speed right here at the 48 minute mark. It looks like your speed in this example is 59 MPFEH. And for those of you who don't know what that stands for, that's miles per flat earth hour. And you know, we all laugh at this, but this might actually come in handy if you need to know the distance you'll travel in 48 minutes at that speed. And in this case, we know it'll be 59 miles. So your rate might not always be 60 minutes, it just depends on the information you need at the time. Okay, for the rest of the video, I'm going to be using knots because I hate using miles per hour when I'm talking about flying. So anytime you hear me say miles for the rest of the video, you can assume I'm talking about nautical miles. I just wanted you to see that it doesn't matter what system of measurement you use, the flight computer works the same for everything. Crazy, huh? So you're surmising the technology was given to these people. The engineering yeah. knowledge, yeah. because this screams mathematics. I will certainly concur to this extent. Someone or some ones had extraordinary knowledge here. This is not easy to build. No. Let's do another one of these really quick. Now let's say I flew 110 miles and it took me 67 minutes to get there. Now how fast am I going? Once again, we'll start with our distance on the outer ring and rotate our 67 minute mark to line up with that. Now we find our rate triangle and read our speed right next to it. Looks like we're flying just over 98 knots ground speed. All right, before we start talking about calculating fuel, I just want to leave you with a couple things to remember. First is that there are basically three parts to all these calculations. You have your outer ring, which is where we find our distance. Then you have your inner ring, which is where you find your time. And then you have your rate. And the key here with the rate is that it's going to be 60 because there's 60 minutes in an hour. So if you want to know your speed in nautical miles per hour or regular miles per hour, this is what you want to use. Last but not least, you need to use common sense to make sure these calculations are accurate. Does the number I'm seeing make sense, or do I need to add or remove a decimal? I gave you my trick with the two tens, but if that doesn't work for you, just think about the result for just a second and make sure these numbers make sense. Now let's talk about how much fuel we're going to be using. 
This one is really simple and it works the exact same way as the distance. Hey, we were visited by ETs. Okay, not quite. It also uses the 60 to 1 rule. But first, you need to know some basic information about your airplane before you can start making calculations with this thing. If you take a look at the performance charts for your airplane, you'll notice that for a given pressure altitude, a certain temperature, and a specific power setting, your aircraft will burn a certain rate of fuel. Let's say, for example, I'm flying at a pressure altitude of 4,000 feet at standard air temperature, and I'll be using a power setting of 2,400 RPM. According to this chart, I'm going to be burning about 8.5 gallons per hour. Now, someone made a very good point in the comments on my last video, and I thought I'd mention that today. As you probably know, standard air temperature is 15 degrees Celsius at the surface. And as you may remember, with a standard lapse rate of 2 degrees every 1,000 feet, technically standard temperature at 4,000 feet is no longer 15 degrees. If you do the math, you'll see that it's actually 7 degrees, so that's something to keep in mind when you're looking at these charts. I want to give a shout out to John for pointing that out to me. It's important to know where all these calculations come from because when it comes to fuel, you want to be as accurate as possible. Anyway, now that we know we're burning 8.5 gallons per hour, what if I fly for two and a half hours? How much fuel would I burn in that amount of time? This is very similar to our distance. First, we know that we're burning 8.5 gallons each hour. So let's make our rate one hour because that's 60 minutes and we'll rotate that over to 8.5. In that case, we'll be on the 85 mark here. Then we'll look around the inner scale for a two and a half hours. Now this is where you can fall into a trap. Your first thought may be to look for a 25 on the inner scale for two and a half hours. You can't do that. These are minutes, so you either need to use the hour scale on the inside or convert to minutes and use the outer part of the inner scale. As you can see, that would be 150 minutes. So in this example, we can see that we're burning 21.1 gallons in two and a half hours. Now you probably just noticed something. My 210 trick really doesn't work for the fuel burn calculations like it does the timing and distance calculations. For this one, you just have to use a little bit of common sense and think about how much fuel you're burning per hour. Which one makes more sense? 211 gallons in two and a half hours or 21.1? Let's do another one. Let's say I'm burning 9 gallons an hour now and I fly for 4 hours. How many gallons would I burn? Well, let's rotate the outer rate mark over to the 9 and see. It looks like 4 hours is 240 minutes. And we'll just look across from there on the outer scale to see that we'll burn about 36 gallons. Now, the cool thing about these whiz wheels is that once you set them up with a rate, it's really easy to find the answers to other problems really quickly. Let's say I wanted to know how long it would take me to burn 30 gallons at the same rate. All I need to do is look over here at the 30 gallon mark on the outer ring to see that we would have about 200 minutes of flight time. Here's a handy one. At night, we need to have 45 minutes of fuel on board to land. How many gallons would that be? Well, if our rate is still nine gallons per hour, we're all set up already. Let's look over here at 45 minutes on the inner scale and it looks like we need 65, 66, 67. We need about 6.8 gallons to be legal when we land. Let's change this around a little bit. Let's say I flew for 50 minutes and I burned 10 gallons. How many gallons per hour did I burn? Well, let's find 10 gallons on the outer ring and rotate 50 minutes up to that mark. Now we can read our rate under the rate triangle. It looks like we burned 12 gallons per hour. It's amazing how this thing can calculate so many different things. Is it possible this technology came from aliens? The ancient alien theory answers that exact question. And the answer is yes. Now let's use these calculations to solve a few different problems that you might see in the airplane. Let's say we're flying across country from Searcy, Arkansas over to West Memphis. After our departure, we flew over our first waypoint at 1347 local time. Then we flew over our second waypoint at 1358 local. What time will we arrive at our destination? Well, the first thing we need to do is to find our distance and we can use our plotter to get that. And when I lay it on here, I'm showing the distance to be 17 nautical miles. Then from that waypoint to our destination, it looks like we have another 41 nautical miles to go. Now what we want to do is to find our ground speed. We arrived at our first waypoint at 1347 and our second waypoint at 1358. 1358 minus 1347 equals 11. It took us 11 minutes to get from our first waypoint to our second waypoint. So let's pull out our flight computer now to find our ground speed. 
The distance of our first leg was 17 miles, and the time it took us to get there was 11 minutes. So we'll rotate 11 minutes on the inner scale over to 17 miles. Now we simply look at our rate triangle. It looks like our ground speed is about 93 knots. Now our flight computer is already set up. All we have to do to find our estimated time of arrival is to take the remaining distance, which we said was 41 miles, and find that on the outer ring of our flight computer. Here it is down here at the bottom. So now we can see that it's going to take us 25, 26, 26.2, 4, about 26.6 minutes. So that would be 26 minutes and 36 seconds. So we can just add that to the time at our last waypoint, which we said was 1358. So we'll reach West Memphis at 1424 and 36 seconds. Now, how much fuel will we burn from the last waypoint to our destination? Let's say we looked in the POH and it says we're going to be burning 9.5 gallons per hour. Let's rotate our rate over to 9.5 and now we're all set up. We just calculated that it's going to take us 26.6 minutes to get there. So let's look for 26.6 minutes on the inner scale. And it's super easy to find because we just found it a second ago. And it looks like we're going to be burning about 4.2 gallons of fuel. Let's do another one of these really quick. This time, let's say we're flying from West Memphis over to Carlisle Municipal Airport. As we fly over our first waypoint, we notice that the time is 1517. And when we fly over our second waypoint, the time is 1529. If our speed doesn't change, what time will we arrive at our destination? Okay, so first of all, we need to figure out how long it took us to fly this leg. If we subtract 1517 from 1529, we can see that it took us 12 minutes. Now, how far was that leg? Let's pull out our plotter and see. It looks to me like it's right at 20 miles. And from there to our destination, it's another 26 miles. So now we can find 20 miles on our flight computer and rotate 12 minutes on the inner scale over to that. And now we can find our speed across from the rate triangle. It looks to me like we're traveling exactly 100 knots. Okay, so now our flight computer is already set up. If we want to know how long it will take us to travel the last 26 miles of our trip, all we have to do is look across from the 26 mile mark on the outer ring. It looks like 15.6 minutes or 15 minutes and 36 seconds. So let's add that to the time at our last waypoint. So we'll arrive at our destination at 1544 and 36 seconds. Now let's say we're burning 8.2 gallons of fuel per hour. How much fuel will we burn in that amount of time? Well, let's move our rate over to 8.2 gallons per hour and see. Once the ratio is set up, let's look at our time of 15.6 minutes on the inner ring and move out from there to get our total gallons burned. I'm getting 2.14 gallons. Now, before we move over to the wind side of the flight computer, I want to take a look at a couple more things you can do with the conversion side of the flight computer. One important thing this thing will calculate is your density altitude. This is extremely important when we're talking about aircraft performance. The higher the density altitude, the less performance you'll have, and the longer your takeoffs and landings will be. In order to find density altitude, you need to know your pressure altitude and the current temperature. Now, I've discussed in several of my videos how to find your pressure altitude, but a really quick way is to simply dial in the standard air pressure of 29.92 inches into the Colesman window of your altimeter and this will give you the current pressure altitude wherever you are. And as you can see here, I have 29.92 set in my altimeter, and it looks like my pressure altitude here is about 650 feet. Now let's say the temperature outside today is 20 degrees Celsius. Now we can find our density altitude with the whiz wheel. First, let's find 650 feet in this little window. As you can see, we kind of have to guess where that is. Then we rotate our temperature of 20 degrees over to that spot. Now we can see our density altitude in this little window right here in the center. It's just above a thousand feet. I'm going to say we have a density altitude of 1,200 feet. And we're going to be talking about density altitude and performance more in a future episode. For now, this is a really quick and easy way to get it. Next, we can convert between true and calibrated altitude. True altitude is the actual height in MSL your aircraft is above sea level. Airports, mountains, and other permanent things are measured in true altitude. And what you actually see on your altimeter is actually slightly different than that. 
As you may remember from my lesson on altimeters, the altitude you read in the airplane or your indicated altitude can be affected by temperature, changes in air pressure, and errors in your altimeter. Calibrated altitude is what your altimeter should read at a certain true altitude, but it doesn't account for the instrument errors because every altimeter is a little bit different. So this is the easiest way to compare the true altitude of something to what you can expect to see on your altimeter, minus the very slight errors that your altimeter might have. Anyway, if you know your pressure altitude and the temperature, you can compare your true altitude with your calibrated altitude. Let's say you're flying towards a big mountain, and you want to see how high you need to fly in order to clear the top of it. You know the top is a true altitude of 10,000 feet MSL, and you're currently flying at an indicated altitude of 10,500 feet, and the current altimeter setting is 3012. And let's say that's accurate. Are you going to be able to clear that mountain if you don't make any changes? To find out, the first thing we need to do is find our pressure altitude. We can either spin our altimeter over to 2992 and check what the altimeter is reading, or we can simply subtract our current altimeter setting of 3012 from the standard pressure of 29.92. When we do that, we get a negative 0.2, so let's turn that into thousands of feet by moving the decimal to the right three places. And now we subtract 200 feet from 10,500 to get a pressure altitude of 10,300 feet. Next, let's say that at sea level it's zero degrees. If we use a standard lapse rate, that would mean the temperature up here at 10,000 feet is negative 20 degrees. So now, let's see if we can clear this mountain. Okay, for this we'll use this little window right here. We said our pressure altitude was 10,300, and that's somewhere right here. And we'll rotate the temperature of negative 20 degrees right across from that. Now our true altitude will be on the outer scale, and our calibrated altitude will be on the inner scale. Let's see, if we want to miss the top of this mountain at a true altitude of 10,000 feet, we need to see an indicated altitude of 10,550 feet. What did we say our indicated altitude was? We said it was 10,500 feet. So if you're flying in the clouds at 10,500 feet and you think you're good, you just smacked right into the side of that mountain, 50 feet below the peak. It's crazy how these altimeters can give our minds a false sense of security. He is aren't possibly some kind of thoughts that are being projected into your mind, possibly by extraterrestrials. And remember, calibrated altitude doesn't account for any minor instrument error that your altimeter might have. These errors could change things a few feet one way or another. Okay, so one other thing you're going to want to know how to do is to convert your true airspeed to your calibrated airspeed. As I mentioned earlier, how fast you're traveling through the air around you, or your true airspeed, is directly related to your pressure altitude and the temperature. This works almost exactly like the true altitude conversion, but this time we'll be using this window over here. Let's say we're still flying at our pressure altitude of 10,300 feet, and the temperature is still negative 20 degrees up here. What is our true airspeed if we're seeing an indicated airspeed of 118 knots? Well, before we can use our flight computer, we need to convert our indicated airspeed to calibrated airspeed. And to do that, we need to dig out our airspeed calibration table from the POH. Okay, so if I'm seeing 110 knots indicated, that means my calibrated airspeed is 107 knots. And if I'm flying 120, my calibrated airspeed is 117. In both cases, I would subtract 3 knots, and my airspeed of 118 knots falls in between those. So let's subtract 3 knots from 118 to get a calibrated airspeed of 115 knots. Next, let's dig out the flight computer and start with our temperature and air pressure window here. We'll find our pressure altitude of 10,300, and then we can rotate our temperature of negative 20 degrees over to that. Now we simply find our calibrated airspeed of 115 knots on the inner ring, and we look across to find our true airspeed is just under 131 knots true. As you can see, this is pretty simple, and we're going to do another one of these here in just a minute. But now that we know how to find our true airspeed, let's flip over the flight computer and talk about the winding side. The winding side is extremely easy to use. The only thing you need to remember is that you need to do all the steps in the correct order, and you can't leave out any of the steps or the information it gives you won't be right. Now the important thing to keep in mind about the winding side of the whiz wheel is that it gives us two things. It gives us a wind correction angle and our ground speed. 
If you're flying from Searcy Airport over to West Memphis, you would need to fly a true course of 093 in order to stay on track the whole entire route. But if you want to maintain that course, you'll have to crab into the wind as you fly. But how much should you crab into the wind? That depends on two things, the wind speed and the wind direction. Let's say the wind along my route is going to be 040 at 13 knots. Which way would I need to crab into the wind to stay on course? Well, we'd have to crab slightly to the left. What about a wind of 200 at 7 knots? In this case, we would have a slight tailwind, but we would have to crab slightly to the right to stay on course. And that's all this thing is doing, is telling you how much to crab into the wind, because you always have to point your nose into the wind if you want to stay on course. The other thing this gives us is our ground speed. Our ground speed is the result of two things, our true airspeed and the wind. If our true airspeed is 120 knots and we have a direct headwind of 20 knots, our speed over the ground or ground speed is now 100 knots. The opposite is true for a tailwind. If I have a direct tailwind of 10 knots and my true airspeed was 120, my ground speed is now 130 knots. The whiz wheel accounts for the angle of the wind and gives us an accurate measurement of our ground speed by adding or subtracting our headwind component and it's still able to give us these numbers when the winds are not straight from the front or straight from the back. Now let's see how this thing works. Remember, we need to make sure that we do this in the correct order or this thing is going to give us bad information. If you ever forget, real E6Bs have the instructions written on them. Start with your winds aloft forecast. Let's say our winds are 200 at 7 knots at our cruising altitude today. Let's put that underneath this mark that reads true index. Now, it's important to remember that winds aloft data is always given in relation to true north. You'll need to convert everything to a mag heading before you go fly. Now let's slide the center mark up to a good starting point. I call this the pipper. There are no zeros on this thing, so a good number to start out with is 100. Next, let's make a mark 7 knots up for our wind speed. On a real flight computer, you can draw an X with a pencil and this works really well. Then, we simply rotate the compass card until our true course is underneath the index here. And we said that was going to be 093, so we'll throw that in here now. And now, we have one more thing to do before this thing gives us good information. This thing is completely wrong until you do this last step. We need to slide the mark we made earlier down to our true airspeed. And let's go ahead and say that was 131 knots from the calculations we made earlier. And it's extremely important that you put your pencil mark on the true airspeed and not the pipper. If you do this, your answer is going to be wrong. Now, we simply read our ground speed under the pipper, and it looks to me like our ground speed is going to be 133 knots. And now, you'll notice something kind of cool. This line in the center here is the true course our airplane is going to be flying, and this mark we made earlier, and this line represents the direction the wind is going to be coming from. So you can see that we're going to have a quartering right tailwind on this flight. Now, we need to know how much we need to crab into the wind. And all we have to do here is to look at these marks running up and down. On this chart, these are marked in increments of 2 degrees. But on some whiz wheels, they may be marked every 1 degree. So now, we can see that we need to crab to the right 0, 2, 3, 3 degrees. And if you're trying to update your true course to a true heading, you want to add the numbers on the right of the scale, and you would want to subtract the numbers on the left side of the scale. Notice on the compass card how the numbers get bigger on the right, and they get smaller on the left. This is an easy way to remember this. Now, let's solve a small cross-country problem. Let's say I'm flying back to Carlisle Municipal from West Memphis, and it took me six minutes to get to my top of climb at 4,500 feet MSL. According to my POH, once I reach my cruise speed, I should be traveling at 109 knots true, and my wind at altitude is 220 at 14 knots. How long is it going to take me to get to my destination total? Let's take another look at the winding side of this flight computer. Once again, we'll start with the wind because this is the winding side of the flight computer. So let's put our wind direction up here. That was 220. Then we'll move the pipper up to 100 and make a mark for our wind speed, 14 knots up from the center. Now, let's rotate our flight computer until we hit our true course. This time, our true course is going to be 256. Once that's set, we'll rotate the mark we made down to our true airspeed of 109 knots, and we can read our ground speed underneath the pipper. 
it looks like our ground speed is going to be 97 knots. I can see that I'm going to have a headwind coming from the front left, so I need to crab my airplane to the left to stay on course. It looks like I'll be subtracting 0 to 4 degrees from my true course to get a true heading of 252 degrees. And now, to change that over to a mag heading, I'll look down at the isogonic line on the sectional to see that I need to add 1 degree of westerly variation to fly a magnetic heading of 253. And today, I'm flying a fancy 172 SP with the G1000 in it. So there's no deviation in this plane because this guy uses magnetometers to sense the magnetic fields in this area. So I don't need to make any compass deviation corrections. So that will make my final course heading 253. And that's going to be really important for this flight. But that's not the question we are trying to find the answer to. We're trying to figure out the total time it's going to take us to get to our destination. Well, if it's 75 nautical miles to our destination, and it took us 8 miles to get to our top of climb, that means we have 67 miles to go. Let's go back to the front side of our flight computer and find our ground speed on here. We said our ground speed was 97 knots, so let's rotate the inner ring until the rate triangle lines up with 97. Now let's find our distance of 67 miles on the outer ring, and we'll read our time underneath that. It looks like it's going to take us 41.5 minutes to go those 67 miles. So what's the total time it's going to take us? Well, don't forget to add the time it took us to get to our top of climb. We said that it was going to take 6 minutes, so 41.5 plus 6 equals 47.5 minutes. So it's going to take us 47 minutes and 30 seconds total for this trip. Now what if I took off with 12 gallons of fuel in the tanks? Would I be legal to fly all the way to my destination? Now I know you're probably thinking, why would you do that? I mean, that's pretty stupid, but would I be legal? Well, according to the POH, we're going to be burning 8.5 gallons per hour with the current conditions. So let's set up our flight computer and see. I'll put 8.5 under the rate here. Then I'll look for 41.5 minutes on the inner scale. Looks like we're going to be burning about 5.9 gallons of fuel from our top of climb to our destination. Then, if we add 1.5 gallons for the fuel we'll burn during the climb, and the 1.4 gallons we'll burn for start, taxi, and takeoff, we're looking at 8.8 .8 gallons. We took off with 12 gallons of fuel, and we're going to burn 8.8. .8. That leaves us with 3.2 gallons of fuel. And we need to land with 30 minutes of fuel. And we're burning 8.5 gallons per hour, so half of that is 4.25. So are we legal? No, we're not. But would it be legal if we put 1.05 gallons of fuel on the plane before we took off? That would make us land with exactly 4.25 gallons. So technically, yes, it would be legal. But would it be smart? Hey, nudge, nudge. Okay, so now let's take this a little bit farther. I went ahead and put one and a half extra gallons in my plane to be legal for this little cross country. So now, how do I know that I'm making good time and that I'm actually flying a ground speed of 97 knots? This is important to know because if our ground speed is slower than 97 knots, it's going to take me longer to get to my destination. And I can't afford to be late because I put the minimum amount of fuel in my airplane. And I'm burning 8.5 gallons per hour. Well, one way is to calculate your ground speed every time you pass over a waypoint like we've already done. But another way is to find the indicated airspeed that we should be flying and see if we're getting the indicated airspeed that we expected. To find our indicated airspeed, we need to start with our ground speed and work the winding problem backwards. We said our wind was 220 at 14 knots, so we'll put that here in our flight computer. And we'll make our mark 14 knots above the 100 for our wind speed. Then rotate the wheel back to our true course of 256. Now up until this point, everything's been the same as before. Except this time, we know our ground speed, but not our true airspeed. So let's put the pipper on the ground speed of 97 knots and you'll read your true airspeed underneath the mark you made. When you work these problems, the pipper always goes on your ground speed and the mark you make will be your true airspeed. Now we can see that our true airspeed is 109 knots. And had we written that down earlier when we did these calculations, let's say on a nav log or something, we wouldn't have had to do this again. Now let's convert that to our indicated airspeed. Remember, the first step in doing that is to get our calibrated airspeed. So let's flip over the flight computer to get that. Let's say the temperature at altitude is 15 degrees Celsius and our pressure altitude is 4,000 feet. 
Once these are lined up, we simply find our true airspeed of 109 knots on the outer scale, and it looks like our calibrated airspeed is going to be 101 knots. Now we go back to our airspeed calibration chart to see that our indicated airspeed should be roughly 3 knots faster than our calibrated airspeed. So we should be seeing 104 knots on our airspeed indicator when we fly this cross country. If our speed's faster, that means we'll get there sooner. If our speed is slower, then this is going to affect our ground speed and now I'm starting to get worried about fuel because I took the bare minimum because I'm a nincompoop. Now, I know this all seems kind of complicated, but here are some big takeaways when it comes to getting airspeed information that's actually useful for flight. The two airspeeds that you need to use in flight are your ground speed and your indicated airspeed. True airspeed and calibrated airspeed are important, but you won't know what these are unless you calculate them or you have a fancy airplane that calculates them for you. So if you want to know the ground speed you're getting, you have to work backwards from your indicated airspeed to your calibrated airspeed to your true airspeed to get your ground speed. If you know your ground speed, but you want to find your indicated airspeed, you need to work these in the opposite direction to figure that out. And by keeping that in mind and working through these problems methodically, that will make it easier to solve them. Okay, now I want to show you how to do one more thing with the whiz wheel because it might come in handy on your written exam. And that's how to calculate the actual wind you're getting up at altitude. Let's say you're flying a ground track or a true course of 256, but in order to stay on course, you have to fly a magnetic heading of 264. Your ground speed is 135 knots and your true airspeed is 123 knots. What are my actual winds? To solve this problem, we first need to find our true heading. In this area, our variation is 1 degree west. Now normally, west is best so you would add 1 degree to get your magnetic heading. But when you're working backwards like this, you would do the opposite. So we would subtract 1 degree to give us a true heading of 263. Now let's find our wind correction angle. Our true heading is 263. Now we need to subtract our true course of 256 from that to give us a wind correction angle of 7 degrees. And since this number is positive, that means it's 7 degrees to the right. Now let's subtract our true airspeed from our ground speed. 135 minus 123 equals 12. Now let's pull out the whiz wheel. Now remember, we're completely working backwards this time to find the wind, so we need to start with our true course this time under the true index. And we said that was 256. Then let's put our pipper on our ground speed of 135 knots. Remember, no matter what, the pipper always goes on your ground speed. Now we need to find where our wind correction angle of 7 degrees to the right and our true airspeed of 123 knots intersect and put our mark right there. Once we do that, we simply rotate our mark until it's centered on our true course line. And to make it easier to read, you can slide the pipper down to the 100 mark if you want. Then you can read your wind direction under the true index. Looks like our winds are 027 degrees and the speed of the wind is exactly 20 knots. So winds at altitude are 027 at 20 knots. Pretty amazing, right? And now you know how to use the old whiz wheel. And as you can see, it's a powerful little tool that you can use on your cross-country flights when you're concerned about time, fuel, and distance. And now that you've wasted your time learning about alien technology, in my next video, I'm gonna explain why you actually don't need one of these things. You can do all these calculations without an E6B, and in a lot of cases, it'll actually be faster and more accurate to do so. When that video is available, I'll put it right here. Smash like before you watch the next one, and I'll see you over there. See ya! Well, story's over.